good evening. This is Kazuhiro Aoyama, the director of Resident Evil 3 and the special guest on tonight's Crimson Head Elder podcast. Can you see that area behind me beneath the red tinted sky? That is what's left of Raccoon City. Our platoon is cut off! No survivors left! You are the star of the death in here! And be eaten by one of those undead monsters! We're both gonna die! Wait! Don't shoot! Down! I lost all my men because of her! All is lost! Cries of agony! Welcome to the Crimson Head Elder Podcast, your favourite podcast about your favourite video game, the number one rated survival horror podcast on iTunes, and our special guest tonight is a true icon of the genre. He worked extensively on the design and creation of both Resident Evil 1 and 2, leading to him becoming the director of Resident Evil 3 a Capcom legend. This evening's exclusive interview is with Kazuhiro Aoyama, and it's a gamer's privilege of a lifetime to say, Aoyama-san, thank you from the bottom of our hearts, and welcome. Thank <laughs> you. I'm uh, Kazuhiro Aoyama. Uh, hello, everybody. Joining us live from Tokyo, our Yama-san will be answering questions from the survival horror community, submitted at our site forum. Also in Japan, with our star guest, is Japanese translator Code Veronica Freak, who will be translating those questions and the sure to be fascinating answers. This interview, with all our podcasts, can be found at our survival horror website, crimson-head.com. That's crimson-head.com, and at our YouTube channel, Resident Evil Podcasts. You can also subscribe to us on iTunes, find us in the video game section, and keep up to date on all our exclusive features by following our Twitter newsfeed at Crimson underscore head. Back to this exclusive interview and Mr. Aoyama. Biohazard was released 20 years ago, and Bio3 was released 18 years ago. It's been 20 years since the release of the original Resident Evil and 18 years since the release of Resident Evil 3. And there are hundreds of games released every year, but even now there are people out there who love Resident Evil and enjoy talking about it. So, as a game developer, having been able to release something that people haven't forgotten even after all this time is something that is by far the most valuable of it all. It's more valuable than money, it's more valuable than fame. And I feel that even if you make games, if there aren't people out there who enjoy playing games, then there's no point in doing it. And there are people out there maybe who don't like games or who don't think very highly of games, but I do feel that. It's great that there are people out there who can enjoy. So to all the players out there, from the bottom of my heart, thank you very much. Thank you. Biohazard を皆さんの忘れられないものを大切なものになるように支援していることそれは素敵なことやとすごく思います。サイトを運営しているジョージトレバーさんありがとうございます。so yes, and regarding Crimson Head, the website, uh, it's been around for over 10 years, and 
part of the reason why Biohazard Resident Evil has been unforgettable is because of websites like yours and the fans that like to read it. So to George Trevor, the headmaster, the webmaster of Crimson Head, thank you very much. So yeah, even now, I really enjoy playing retro games such as Asteroid and Choplifter. Oh, Asteroid. <laughs> One of my favorites. I have a lot of games that I have played in the past. And if I can talk with them, I will be able to talk with them. Yeah, and I still respect the people who made the game Asteroid, and it'd be nice if I could go do something with them sometime. What? <laughs> That's how I felt for a long time, and I think、uh, everybody, all the players, can identify with that to some extent. To hear you mention Asteroids, because it was my first true love and first experience <laughs> with video games, I wasn't even tall enough to peer into that screen. And I also just have to say that the fans, the passion of those fans that you mentioned, The responsibility on myself to present this interview to those fans was why I was so nervous. But I've completely, my nerves have completely gone, and I'm just sat here with a, I realize with a huge beaming smile on my face. <laughs> It's wonderful to hear you mention my website and the fans. Thank you so very, very much for coming and, and being with us. It, it, it's a, a true honor. Thank you. またちょっとまだちょっと僕の方から話し続けあるんやけどもいいか。Yeah,、um, he would like to continue talking a little bit about some of his background, if you don't mind.、うん、Absolutely. テレビゲームが、えー、できて50年っていう、うん、もうずいぶん長いこと経ってるんですけども、うん、すごく特殊な人じゃない限り、うんえー、ゲームファンだった人が今ゲームを開発してるし、これからもそういう形っていうのは続いていくんだと思います。で。今回のインタビューっていうのが、えー、またこれから、えー、新しいゲームの時代を作っていく人,ための、えー、人たちのための何かのいい刺激になればいいなと思って今回、えー、インタビュー引き受けようと思いました。So the history of television, TV games has spanned about 50 years at this point and there's always a new generation of game creators coming up who are Tasked with the responsibility of creating new games. So I'm hoping that this interview will inspire or move people and help them create that new generation of games. Tada, eh, Bokwa, Nisen Yonen ni, Capcom, Taishok, Steimas. The Biohazard, eh, Ima demo, Kayas got Zitiru title. The Atarashi, eh, Omosira, so, Tsukuru, Tame, ni, eh, Character, ya, Sekai, Sette, Nanka, wa, Ima demo, Iroyo, to, eh, 更新がかかっていることは、えー、当然あると思いますし、それを今決めれるのはカプコンだけですね。皆さんご存知だと思いますけども。なので、えっと、今回のインタビューに関して、僕の話というのは、えー、基本的に参考としてもらいたいなと。それを理解してください。で、えー、僕が今回話すのは、当時、えー、僕がどんな気持ちや、えー、意識を持ってそれを作っていたかということを、えー、いろいろと話していきたいと思います。So, I would just like all of our listeners to understand that I worked on Resident Evil, but I left Capcom in 2004. And the Resident Evil series now、uh, is still going, it's an ongoing series. But as you all should know, the direction has changed over the years, different people have worked on it. So, by doing this interview, I just want everyone to be clear that this is all just for reference. I will be talking about My personal feelings about the series, certain things that happened during the development, what kind of environment I was in. But I would just like everyone to know that with regards to the current Resident Evil series, what happens these days is something for Capcom to decide. And Capcom is the company that's kind of setting that, that road. So yeah, please be aware of that as you listen to this interview. Hi, I got all. All right, go ahead, Paul. Okay, I stated in my introduction your role working for Capcom as the director of Biohazard 3, but you were also very much part of the teams working on both Resident Evil 1 and 2. Firstly, may I ask, how did you come to be working for Capcom, a leading company in the industry, and what was your role for that first Biohazard game? I wanted to be able to work for Capcom. 
、以前に僕はあの、えー、役者を、えー、してました。えー、在学中にいろいろと、えー、舞台に出たりして、えー、やってたんですけども、えー、役者だと、えー、ご飯が食べれない<笑>っていうのがまず第一点であって、えー、まあ、もともとゲーム自体はすごく好きやったんで、えーもしゲームの会社に応募してダメやったらもう確実な芝居の道を進んでいこうかっていうふうに思っていたんですけども、うんまあ、そんなところにカプコンから入社できるっていうことを話はもらえたのでそれでカプコンに入ることにしましたで個人的にはプロレス、まあ、格闘技プロレスっていうのがすごく好きなんで,で僕自身も柔道や空手をできる方なんです。<笑>で、本当やったら、えー、プロレスラーになりたいなっていうふうに思ってたんですけども、えー、体を壊してしまったんで、それで、うん、役者の方になろうと思ったんですが、まあ、ちょっとここで一回続きました。<笑> Alright, so I'd like to tell you a little bit about my background, which might surprise some people. But、um, actually, before I joined the Capcom, I was actually studying acting. I had done some acting gigs, but I had also liked games growing up. Uh, such as Asteroid, as he mentioned earlier. So before I joined Capcom, I actually thought about becoming a pro wrestler. <laughs> I actually also studied、uh, martial arts, such as judo and karate. So I did have that kind of background, but、uh, it turns out I injured myself at some point. So I gave up on the dream of becoming a wrestler and then I became an actor. And then, as luck would have it, I found a job opening at Capcom. And that's how I ended up joining the company. 当時、えー、カプコンだったら、えー、ストリートファイターズっていうのが、うんえー、すごく大人気なんで、僕は、えー、格闘ゲームをすごく作りたかったので、うん、カプコンに応募しました。Uh, <笑> yeah, and、uh, I joined Capcom around the time Street Fighter 2 had become a very big game. And the reason why I had actually applied to work at Capcom was because I wanted to make fighting games like Street Fighter 2. <笑>そうちょうどそうだ、ね、今の話の流れで話すと、えーえー、カプコン、まあ、会社に入った時に、まあえー、いろんな先輩とか言われるんだけども、自分の作りたいゲームが作れると思うなよっていうのが<笑>、まず、えー、一点あって、プロとしてゲームを作るっていうところだから、好きだから作るんじゃない。プロとしてそのものに真摯に付き合って作っていくんだ。<laughs> so, yeah, actually, when I joined Capcom, what a lot of my coworkers,、um, the people who were at the company before me, told me was that don't expect to make the game you specifically want to make. You have to be, above all, a game making professional. You have to make games as a professional and、mm. not as something you do just because you like it. So, yeah, that, those are the things that I remember being told to me when I first joined the company. あと、バイオワンでも、えー、役割って言ったらあれなんですけども、うんえー、最初は、えー、どちらかというと、いろんな資料の整理っていうのが一番最初の役割でした。はいえー、ちょうど新人で入ってきたのが、入ったのが2000、えー、2000じゃない、1995年で、えー、ちょうどバイオハザードがこれから忙しくなっていくだろうといったタイミングで、えー、チームに入る。As for my role on Resident Evil 1, at the very beginning, I had managed or organized a lot of the materials related to the game's development. I had joined the company in 1995 as a new grad, straight out of university. And I had joined the team right when Capcom had expected the development of the game to become busier and more intense. So my first job was you know, organizing those materials, development materials. そこから、えー、まあ、いろいろと資料をまとめていってる中で、例えば、バイオハザードシリーズでよく、えー、言われたのは、映画的な演出っていう話があったと思うんですけども、えー、僕が入る前は、えー、どちらかというと、キャラクターの画像が、顔、絵が出て、そこに吹き出しが出て会話するっていうようなことを想定していたもので、僕はちょうど、えー、芝居をやってたとか、そういったところもあったんで、まあ、せっかくポリゴンであるんだから、えー、これもう演出をもうその映像で見せたらどうだっていうのをあの最初に提案しました。で、それが、えー、じゃあやってみるかってことで、どんどん作っていくようなことになって、いろいろと仕様書を書いたりだとか
、えー、そういったことを任されるようになっていって、最後の方、えー、そうですね、まあ、そこから、えー、いろいろと、まあ、ずっとゲームに触って、で、いろいろ演出とかを作ったりしていっている中で、すごくゲームに触っていたんで、ゲームのプレイの調整をするようになります。最終的には。After he joined the team,、uh, he had spent that time gathering all of the development materials and organizing them. And, you know, he came up with a few ideas that did, or I rather came up with, with the ideas that influenced some of the game's final direction. So, One of the things that they had been thinking about at the beginning of the game was to have these still images that depict the game's cutscenes. So, not, not like what we ended up with in the final game with the moving cutscenes, but with like still scenes. But since the game was going to be made、uh, using polygons, 3D polygons, you know, I suggested that maybe we should use、uh, movie sequences instead. So, I ended up suggesting that to the team,、uh, and it was accepted actually. So, what ended up happening was they asked me to make, I guess, con concept documents or planning documents that allowed us to figure out how we would implement these new features. And so I did that,、uh, did a few other things as well. The team ended up asking me to take care of a lot of the system planning related elements of the development. So, that's what I ended up doing at the end of the process. Yeah, uh, 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 犬バレーンって出てくるところは、あれは僕が作ったところだし、うん、あの、ホールで、ワードイーザーっていう、あの、演技を作ったのも、僕のプラン。Oh, okay, so yeah, sorry, I'm not referring to the, like, the, the, the cutscenes themselves. I'm talking about in-game cutscenes. I'm referring to when the dog busts into the hallway. Oh, wonderful. Or when Barry says, what's this? You know, how, how all those specific scenes in the game play out. So, I guess you have me to thank for the <laughs> dogs jumping into、yeah. the hallway. Well, I was going to ask, are you aware how that's just become part of Resident Evil folklore and not just Resident Evil gamers, but across universally, video gamers will mark that as one of their highlights in their, their video game lives. And that truly is an iconic moment across Resident Evil history, not just the first game. <laughs> ちょうど当時、えー、それを作った時なんですけども、はいえー、三上さんが、えー、と知らない人を連れてきて、うん、ちょっとここをプレイしてくれということで、うん、させるテストプレイさせる、うん、でそんで犬が後ろからガーンって出てきてうわーってこう飛び上がるのを見てあ,あこれは面白くなりそうだなっていうふうに三上さんは思ってくれたみたいで。うん<笑> oh, so I, I have an interesting、uh, story about that. So after we had implemented that scene into the game,、uh, 三上さん Asked someone completely unrelated to the, to the project to come test the game out. And Mikami san had that person go through the hallway. That person wasn't expecting anything, but when the dog appeared into the hallway, that person ended up panicking. He ended up screaming, like, oh! <laughs> you know,、so. Yeah, there's lots of parents that are going to want to speak to you because you're responsible for hundreds、mm -hmm. and thousands of children across Europe and America and Japan, of course, as well, scaring some very young children. <laughs> 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 ああまあ、あのちょうど当時はちょこちょこっと、えー、暴力的な表現がみたいなそんな感じで言われて言われ始めたのが、えー、ちょうどその頃じゃないかなと思いますね。So yeah, I think,、um, I guess a popular catchphrase, or not catchphrase, but term in gaming would be violent scenery, right? Violent scenes. Right? And I think that term popped up around the time of Resident Evil's release. <laughs> I've heard, you know, from time to time about people complaining about getting a little too shocked when playing the game. I'm not a fan of gore, and I wasn't drawn to Biohazard 3 and the Biohazard series as a fan of gore. It's the atmosphere, even with the dogs jumping through. It's all about how, how it makes you as a game player feel rather than actual, you know, over the top gore on the screen. アドベンチャーゲームっていうので、えー、キャラクターを動かしてっていう形っていうのはあまりその当時はなかった部分はあると思うんでそれは確かに楽しい体験だったんじゃないか Yeah, I guess if you think about, you know, when the time, about the time the game came out originally, where you can directly control the character and, you know, influence where they go were kind of a rarity back then. So I, I can see why you would have found those elements to be quite interesting. Joe White, who is the voice actor for Chris Redfield, 
he mentions that scene with the dogs bursting through the windows as his favorite moment in video games. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> um, well, moving on to Biohazard 2, did you take on a similar role? What were your responsibilities for the sequel? All right, so yeah, going into the sequel, I was placed in direct uh, control of how the players would move, how the enemies would move, all those kinds of calculations, and I also designed the map for the sewer levels. Initially, Shinji Mikami he had an idea for the game to be in first person. With yourself being responsible for the player controls, was that ever discussed for the sequel? There was never any intention to turn it into a first person shooter. Yeah, so he was in charge of the controls. There was no talk about first person. リッカーはえ、これまたちょっと違う、違って、これはファミコン通信っていう雑誌があるんですけども、その応募で生まれた。ネーミングを応募する企画があって、またなんですか。と、開発してるみんなではえっと、え、ちょうど目が見えないってい
that we also discuss with great passion and detail characters such as Dario Rosso. And there are questions, as you know, about Dario Rosso and trying to identify his daughter. And people will talk and debate at length. What? What? <laughs> you, yeah, that's, that's, that's him. Okay, we've got to get out of here. What? What do you think you're talking about? I just lost my daughter out there. How dare you tell me to go back outside? I'm sorry about your daughter, but there isn't going to be any rescue. We have to get out of here. No! I'm not going anywhere. I'd rather starve to death in here than be eaten by one of those undead monsters. Now leave me alone! USS Command from Kentucky, he asks, was there a reason for the fourth survivor starting with Hunk face down in the water? And have you followed the inclusion of Hunk's character in the series after Biohazard 3?え、それで下を向いてると。で、あの、1個あるのは水が見つかってるっていうのは、え、ちょうど作ってる時も話してて、あの、下水道の水がま、ちょうど張った状態で水の中でブワーって出てくるようなえ、演出が最初あったんです
and onward, Capcom omitted mm -hmm. many survival horror features, including the static camera, item boxes, pre-rendered backdrops, non-linear, unrushed exploration, atmosphere-focused gameplay, and the limitation on ammo. Now, reasons cited have been that many of these classic features are incompatible with modern gamers and the desire to progress the series. I personally believe that this had a detrimental effect on the series as an intelligent survival horror experience, and I was wondering what you felt about this debate. ま、元々お客さんがいるっていう中で同じことを続けてたらえ、なんかちょっと面白くえ、ずっと同じことやるんで面白くなくなってきたなっていう風に思われてしまう。あまり変えなけなかったらそういう風に思われてしまうし、変
and why do you think neither were progressed as features for installments after Biohazard 3? これは、あの、まあ、バイオ3だけども、バイオ3じゃなかったことがあるっていうのが、まず大きな要因かなと。えっ、ー、と、そもそも、えー、バイオ3っていうものは、えー、スピンオフの作っていう形で、えー、規模も、規模のすごく小さいタイトルだったんです。で、そのために、本来のシリーズタイトルやったら、ボリューム、もうたっぷりでしっかりと遊び応えっていったところを作るだけの、えー、期間とか、えー、お金があるわけなんですけども、えー、残念ながらその外伝にはそこまでの余力がない。で、ただ、あの、遊んだ感じっていうので、えー、それを活かす、えー、それと、えー、前のシリーズと同じぐらいの遊んだ感じを、感覚を出すために、何回も遊んでもらえるようにするっていうことを考えたんです。それが、その、ライブセレクションであり、えー、玉を作る。で、うん、いったところの発案につながっています。All right, so I must explain the history of the development of Resident Evil 3. Because as many people might know, Resident Evil 3 was not originally 3. It was supposed to be a spin-off title. And in being a spin-off title, it was supposed to be a smaller game with a smaller budget and a smaller scale in general. So basically, we were tasked to do with this spin off Resident Evil game, this Gaiden like Resident Evil game, was to create a game whose development can be completed within a short period of time. And when you play the game, you would be able to play through it in a fairly short amount of time. I guess similar to arcade games, you would be able to play this game, play through this game multiple times、uh, in order to get the most enjoyment out of it. That's why Resident Evil 3 might seem a little different <laughs> to, to some people. When that decision was changed, how much more content was then added? <laughs> well, it, it's probably not, not as much as you would imagine. <laughs> not as much as you might imagine. Who created the water sample puzzle? It's notoriously known as by far and away the most difficult in the entire series. ちょっとも,もっと分かりにくかったんやけども、できるだけ分かりやすくしたつもりであるんやけども、確かに出した後にはこれ難しいってよく言われたのは確かにその水質、紙質の不合なんで、これは申し訳なかったです。ごめんなさい。Uh, <笑> I will admit it's probably my fault.、Uh, so yeah, at this point in the development, I wasn't the one who was directly managing the game system because I was a director, so the director doesn't actually do that. It's up to the system planner. What I would end up doing during the development was if something wasn't quite right, I would be the one to fix it myself because、uh, I was the one who was most experienced on the team.、Uh, and I remember people coming up to me about the water sample puzzle actually and、um, <laughs> complaining about it. I really wanted the game to have an element of challenge、yeah. to it. I didn't want to make it too easy,、um, but I also wanted to make it quite manageable. I remember looking at the puzzle, and indeed it was pretty difficult. So、uh, I, did, I think I did end up leaving it in. But I, I do apologize to, to the people who might have had a tough time with that, that puzzle. <laughs> Apology accepted. I mean, it's the one puzzle that I have to, every single time, I have to refer to a guidebook to get me through it. Why was I just being all? ワイオ3は、あの、まあ、前の2つと違って、うん、えー、パズルも、えー、ランダムで答えが変わるようにして、どっちが、まあ、さっき言った何回も遊んでもらうためでもあるんですけども、うん、あの、基本的に、えー、割と、そう、そうあたりをすると、えー、必ず解けるっていうのも、一つの特徴にしているつもりではいるんです。あの、なんで、狙ってやることもできるけども、全部のパターンをやれば必ず解けるというつもりでも作ってるんですわ。えー、試してみれば、どれかで必ず解けるだろうという形にはしてるつもりではあったんです。<笑>なるほどね。<笑>
Well, yeah, I mean, you know, going back to how we conceived uh, Resident Evil 3 to begin with, it was supposed to be a shorter game that you can play multiple times, which is why this is the Resident Evil game that has all the randomized puzzle elements. You know, they change from playthrough to playthrough. Uh, yes. Yeah, and basically, um, the reason the reason why we ended up, you know, having the puzzles the way they were, you know, versus the, the fixed puzzles from 1 and 2 is that I wanted gamers to, you know, have something to fall back on. If you know what I mean, like if you try all the patterns, one of them will stick, yeah. right? And that will help you get through the game. So that, that, that was an intentional design element. We respect the differences of Resident Evil 4, 5, and 6, but I personally, I miss the fact that these games have omitted those types of cerebral puzzles that you reference as, as mm. wanting to give the gamer something to think of. So you've got the balance perfect, but unfortunately, I don't believe that uh, in subsequent installments, uh, some of the puzzles were mm. extremely easy to the point where they w effectively weren't puzzles at all. <laughs> え、方位法っていうのはどちらかというと手を止めてっていう部分をもちろん大事だと思うんです。打ってなんぼとか行動しなんぼっていうところが行動して探してとかがどっちかというと主軸になってるんでちょっとパズル簡単することにしてえアク
on that, the Oracle Dragon from Pennsylvania, she wanted to know who was Nemesis? Uh, did he have a backstory prior to being a BOW? Was that discussed at all? No, Nemesis was who was that? So, do you have a backstory? I don't know. <laughs> well, yeah, we didn't we didn't really、um, think that much into it, but I guess you can say whoever it is, it's probably very interesting. <laughs> <laughs> we were talking earlier about the water puzzle and that balance between having it not too hard and not too difficult. I want to ask, why is that first Nemesis encounter so hard? And I know that you'll have sympathy with me because you very kindly discussed in our message exchanges that in preparation for this interview, we're playing Resident Evil 3 and you kept dying at that particular spot. And we, <laughs> we both shared our experiences of that is so, for me, that's the hardest encounter of all, that very first one. <laughs> 倒そうと思ってしまうじゃないですか。でも、それだと、逃げるゲームにならない。戦うゲームになってしまうんで、うん、最初の印象として、こいつは逃げないとやばいな、思わせたかったんで強くしてるし、弾、うん、もそんなに置いてないっていうことになって、うん、してましたね。なるほど。Well, yeah,、um, we wanted Resident Evil 3 to be a game where you run away, right? Where you're supposed to be. Hence the Japanese subtitle. If we didn't make that first encounter so difficult, people would, players would think, okay, I can take this guy down.、Mm. I'll take him down. And then the rest of the game will kind of just jump off that point. Yeah. If we didn't, you know, give players a sense of the urgency to run away, the game's direction would change quite considerably. So, you know, when you have that first boss battle, when you're foolish enough to try to fight him, and then you realize, you know, you have to run away or, or you're going to die. Right? That, that was the kind of feeling we wanted to give players very early on in the game. So there would be no misunderstandings. Absolutely. From that very first moment, you're in great, great fear. You feel in great peril whenever. And when you hear that music each time, yeah, it really does strike fear into you. Just a little bit, I want to hear it, but I want to hear it. 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 でも、クリアできなかったんです。<笑>うん、どこまでたどり着いたんですか<笑>、えっと、時計と、何<笑>しか聞けなかったんです。なんか記憶が浅いとか、それと難易度が。難易度っていうところと、<笑>あの、し、うん、まったセーブしてなかったっていう死に方が何回もあって。同じとこ何回も何回もや,やってて、で、えー、<笑>これじゃ良くないよなっていうことで、まあ、プレイすることはちょっと諦めて、ね、プレイムービーを<笑>。これはヘビーモードでした。えー、ヘビーモード、YouTube で、えー、見て、あの、準備しました。えー、All right, well, I, or Aoyama さん、rather, in preparation for this interview, I did, as you said, play Resident Evil 3, and I did play it for around 10 hours, but, For being the director of the game,、uh, I actually was unable to complete it. <laughs> I made it to the clock tower, actually. But the problem is, the game is、uh, quite difficult, and there were parts when I died after not having saved any time recently. So I ended up having to repeat a lot of the same parts <laughs> over and over again. It's fascinating that the very director of the game s suffers the same heartache as the players. That's wonderful to hear. I was playing in heavy, heavy mode? In, in Japanese, it's heavy mode. I think yes, it's hard mode. It's a hard in, mode、uh, in Barhazard 3, yes. Oh, okay. So, yeah, hard in English, heavy in Japanese. And yeah, that's why at, at some point I gave up and I <laughs> ended up watching a playthrough video instead. <laughs> <laughs> Very sorry. <laughs> well, you, we'll let you off. You are the director. If the director can't do that, who can? <laughs> Um, from that game player's point of view, do you have any favorite locations in the game? The city is a zombie that 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 is で、レイオブザデッドの、えー、シーンで2つ好きなところがあって、で、一回ちょっと切った方がいいな。<笑> uh, yeah,、um, probably my favorite areas in the game 
were parts where we can encounter lots of zombies. So I think the the initial city streets. Yeah, they're my favorite. Absolutely. Yeah, like at the beginning of the game, especially.、Um, and I think the reason for this is that in terms of、um, the like some of my favorite horror movies, I'm a really big fan of both Dawn of the Dead and Day, Day, Day of the Dead. Yes. Yes. ドーモンオブザデッドの、えー、冒頭で、Hello everyone there, Hello、yeah. there. <笑>と、えー、デーオブザデッドの一番面白いところで、えー、と最後の方で、えー、エレベーターがガコンガーって落ちてきたときに、うん、その上にゾンビがドゥルアって、うんえー、乗っかって、うん、あのその地下の、えー、キッチンみたいなところにゾンビだらけになる。っていううん、そのシーンがすごく好きで、この溢れ出してる、うん、こいつらどうしようどう、どうやって逃げたらいいのっていう、うん、そういうようなか、すごく静かなシーンのところに、ひたひたっと寄ってくるようなところとか、一気に襲いかかってくるとか、そういったところで緩急をつけていきたいなっていうふうに、すごく思って、えー、作ってました。で、その街のところでは、えー、そういった感覚になれるんじゃないかなっていうふうに、うん、思ってます。はい。Yeah,、um, going back to the beginning of Dawn of the Dead,、uh, that's the kind of feel I was aiming for with Resident Evil 3. And I really like those kinds of scenes. Another scene that I quite liked was the end of the movie where they're riding the elevator and the elevator starts to slow down, and all of a sudden these zombies appear from above, you know, and then like, there's a bunch of tension in that scene. I'm also a fan of scenes where It's quiet, and then all of a sudden you're getting chased by monsters、yes. who are aiming right at you. So I really, I really like those scenes just you know, for the tension. I'm delighted to hear you reference those areas because for me, it's why Biohazard 3 is the highlight of the series. It really, more than any of the other games that were released, it really gets that atmosphere, and you can really feel that George A. Romero. Feel to it on those, those early scenes in the game going through the, the streets of Raccoon City. That's when Resident Evil as a series really perfectly gets that atmosphere right. And also emphasized by the music, I think Resident Evil 3 has one of the most fantastic tracks. And again, we hear many of those tracks during those street scenes. So, so the zombie no Hanas, the zombie Ega no Hanas, the other part, eh, Mosoto Hanas, to Nemesis, no, eh, model, you know, eh, デイオブザデッドで、あの、こう、ゾンビにいろいろ教育して、あの、知的知能があるかとか、なんかそういったことでいろいろ教え込んで、最後、ゾンビが銃をバーン撃つっていう、撃って殺、その研究者が殺されるっていうのがあるんだけども、そういった要素をちょっともらって、作っていったところはありますね。あ研究者が,殺されが、えー、といろいろとものを教え込んで、ゾンビに教えるんやけど、最終的に教えたことによって、研究者が殺されるというシーンがある、うん、あ研究者が死ぬっていう。ちょっと見たことないですね。殺されるんですよ、ゾンビに。うんうん、ゾンビに殺す。あ、ゾンビ。食われるんじゃなくて、銃で殺されるっていう。ああ、ゾンビに。へえ。見ればいいです。<笑>今さら言うんですけど。<笑> Well, yeah, like, since while we're on the topic of zombie movies, in terms of the design of Nemesis, you might remember the scene from the end of Day of the Dead where the, the scientists are in the laboratory and they've been raising or、uh, nurturing these zombies, right? They've taught them all these different things, but then, you know, at the end, what happens is the zombies end up shooting and killing <laughs> the researchers. So, you know, that was something that also went into the design of Nemesis,、oh, those kinds of elements, okay, yeah. Okay. Now, Newspot from Ireland, he wanted to know what does G stand for in G virus and what was the reasoning behind the name? This is the idea of 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 the G would have stood for Gorgoda. Gorgoda? Is that right? Gorgoda. 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 The... So where, yeah, Jesus Christ was pinned to the cross. Well, you know, I mean, I guess that's a very sensitive and touchy topic amongst certain people. So we didn't end up actually using that. Name officially, but that was the idea back in the day. Okay, well, but, but that's where the letter G derives from. Yes, the, the first letter of the word Gorgoda. Fascinating.
Thank you. And <laughs> have you been there? Actually, it's probably in Israel, yeah, right? No, I haven't. I've been to Israel, but it was with a Jewish tour. We skipped out the Jesus <laughs> parts. <laughs> and it's interesting because one of the assets from Barhazard 3, if you blow up the textures to large scale, mm -hmm. there's, a, there's, there's actually a little synagogue and Star of David sign. So there, <laughs> there is a synagogue in Rakhine City. Ah, Rakhine City, synagogue. あの、ユダヤ人の教会、サーブデイデビットの印もあるんですよ。シナゴーグユダヤユダヤ教の方。まあ、まあ、え、これはあんまり、あの、デザイナーの方もあんまり意識してない部分があるかもしれないんで、気
that was, I guess, right after the time my game became Resident Evil 3. So that Resident Evil 3 that was in development with the other team and got moved to PlayStation 2 and then Kanye took over, that became Resident Evil 4. Yeah. But before it can come out as Resident Evil 4, it came out as Devil May Cry. So uh, long, long story short, uh, I had nothing to do with uh, the the very first cruise ship version of Resident Evil 3. So. うん。<笑><笑> Well, go going back to what you were mentioning about, you know, things like the coins and things about the cruise ship, as developers, we're actually quite gun, gun shy about people telling us about these development anecdotes. You know, it's like, you know, these are his actual words, but it, it's like somebody, it's like another person is looking at your private parts. It's not too personal. It's just, it's, it's flattering. Uh -huh that the things, the, the point is, you know, the things that people know can be quite remarkable. You might think that we know all these things about the game development, but it, it's quite possible the fans do know more than... <laughs> we, 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 know how, we know how you feel. Yeah, so, but you know, the, the more detailed things get, it's like, the, the, the more shy we become. We're talking about the various beta builds and the way that these games have this changing development history. In the mm -hmm. early concept stages of Biohazard 1.5, there was a discussion surrounding a stage where Chris and Jill would return to the Spencer Mansion whilst escaping Raccoon City. This stage included a giant worm, eggs and cobwebs depicting a partially destroyed Spencer Mansion. This has been labelled by the fans, I'm not sure erroneously or not, as Biohazard Dash. Is there anything that you can add regarding this scrapped concept? Dash Okay, well, um, as I mentioned earlier, I've never heard the name Resident Evil Dash, but actually, during the early development concepts of Resident Evil 1.5, there was talk of revisiting the destroyed Spencer Mansion. However, I don't remember specifically if it was supposed to be Chris or Jill. I don't think so, actually. Now on to questions from BSA Arclay from Wales. Did you have jurisdiction and considerable input into the character epilogue files? If so, can you please explain Chris's bloody knife that we see? あ、これジル、あ、クリスのナイフ。あ、こっちついてどうなってるどうしたえ、クリス大丈夫かなっていう風にジルが思うだけのもので、え、何かを示唆してるとか、意図してるっていうものではあんじさせてるっていうものではない
、あと、えー、ちょうどレベッカに関しては、あのうん、同じように、えー、バイオゼロっていうのは、もうその時に開発しているので、うん、そっちで明らかになることやし、うん、あのここでいろいろ言うとあの、それを引用してゼロを作らなきゃいけなくなる可能性もあるんで、うん、あえて言ってない。そうカルロスはあってもいいのかもしれないけどもあの9人の中からは1枚落ちるんじゃないかなっていうふうに考えてる。OK、そう、あ、uh, あ、yeah. As you can see from the screen, there are only nine slots. We wanted to go with the nine most important characters in the series that had the most significance. That said, Rebecca was also quite significant. We're not saying she's not important, but. Resident Evil Zero was also in development at the time, and we figured that people would find out what happened to her in that game instead. Because, you know, it being a prologue, or a, a, pre, a prequel、yes. rather, you know, if we talked about what happened with Rebecca after, accidentally spoiled the game or something, so we didn't want to do that. Our mentality was, well, we should let Zero take care of Rebecca's storyline, and then we'll let the other people take the spotlight. I mean, we could have had a prologue for Carlos as well, but there were only nine slots, so. <laughs> Now, of course, we hear of Hunk again in the epilogue file in Biohazard 3.、Mm. So, Dynamite Heady from Canada he asks, What were your intentions for Hunk's personality? In his epilogue、mm. file, it mentions that he plays with the G virus in the palm of his hand. s Was this to suggest he was careless or maybe invulnerable? His epilogue at the end of Biohazard 3 makes him sound immortal and leaves his story very open. それではないですね。あの、単純にそのエリピローグで伝えたかったことっていうのは、えー、ハンクが G ウイルスを持って逃げたっていうことを言いたかった。So yeah,、um, that's a very interesting analysis, but actually,、um, yeah, we, that, that wasn't the intention at all. <laughs> I all wanted to portray in the epilogue file was that Hunk took the G virus and escaped.、Okay. <laughs> yeah, we, there, there was no, I guess, grand, I guess, what's, what's the word in English?、Um, mo- motive. Chris Chocobo from Spain and Christopher Redfield 96 from North America, they both ask why did your team decide to discard the beta images from the Biohazard 3 prologue? It would have been interesting to see what happened to stars just after the mansion incident. YouTube にアップされてた動画は僕は見ましたわ。で、あの、まあ、さっき言ったからすごく恥ずかしい本題をしました。<笑><笑>で、えっ、ー、と、あれ自体、えー、どういう経緯だったかまでは覚えてないけども、えー、確かジルが、えー、独白で、えー、まあ今こういう状態だっていうことを喋ってるのは3と同じぐらいの長さのものだったと思うんです。うんうんでうんあの何が違うかっていうとあの映像を見せるテンポが違うなっていうふうに思うんで、えー、それで、えー、こういうふうにテンポになるんやったら A 少ない方がもっと、えー、しっとりとした形で、えー、プロローグとして見せれるんじゃないかっていうことで少なくしたんだというふうに思います。ちょっと、えー、自分でも記憶が曖昧なんであれですけども。Well, I'm not sure if my memory is serving me correctly, but I did see that video on YouTube. And, you know, just like what we were talking about earlier, we, you know, the, the more people talk about this, the more shy and embarrassed we get. <laughs> but I think the reason why we ended up not using that in the end was because,、um, as a prologue, it didn't seem to be moving at the right tempo or the right pacing,、okay. rather. We thought about, okay, what would be the best way to portray this prologue? And, you know, we wanted something. Something a little more relaxing and something you know, not as intense as far as the prologue was concerned. So, that's, I believe that's why we ended up making that decision. That's an interesting point. There's been, again, much debate amongst the fans on that very opening scene with Jill, and she bursts out of an exploding building. It's very abrupt. I was wondering if. You could maybe shed light on the nature of that opening scene and, and if there was any thought put into what particular building that was. Prologue の時にまあ銃を構えて座ってるっていうのはえあれ自体はえジルの部屋っていうふうに思ってます。で、そこからムービーカットシーンかなそっちにつながるシーンっていうのはえあれは後付けで作りました。えっと
ちょっと余力ができたんで、あのもうちょっと、えー、ゲームの要素をいろいろ教えることができるように、ということで、あのその演出を付け加えたもんなんです。なので、あのなぜドカーンっていって、ゴロゴロゴロって飛んでくるかっていうと、緊急回避っていうのがあるんだよ。うんっていうのを見せたかったところと、ちょうどあそこのシーンでやるのは、えー、段差を登るっていうのをさせると思うんです。なんでそこで、えー、ゲームとしてこういうことをやるんだなっていうのを覚えてもらうために付け加えた演出なんですよ。あれは。あれ、あのアパート自体はジルのものとかそういうことを考えてやっ作ってるものじゃなくて、ちょうど作る言うても、あの、全部が全部新規でできないから、あの、どっか、えー、違う背景からそのビルっていうのを移植して背景の画像としてるのは確かないけども、意識としてジルの家と思ってもらってもいいし、いろいろ、えー、逃げ回ってるところから出てきたっていうふうに思ってもらってもいいかなっていうところでそのシーンを作りましたね。はい。Yeah, so, in regards to how the, the prologue and Jill's、uh, first cutscene of bursting out the building are connected, So the prologue was made long before the、uh, scene that we're talking about. Resident Evil 3 you know, was developed to reuse the assets of other Resident Evil games. So, in terms of why the scene was crafted the way it was, we wanted Jill to appear some, from somewhere very abruptly and very quickly. And that's why she's shown just bursting out of a building. We didn't purposely make it so that she was specifically busting out of her apartment, but if that's what people want to assume, then that's perfectly fine. There's nothing wrong with assuming that. You know, you can think that maybe she went through a lot of stuff before bursting out of、yeah. there. And this should be pretty obvious, but the prologue did show scenes of Jill's apartment. So you can kind of draw the, you can make, maybe make a connection between those two. But if you ever wondered why we had that crate at the very beginning of the game that Jill has to climb、yes. over it, that was put in there because we wanted players to realize that they can climb objects. Ah,、oh, like a tutorial very quickly. Yes. Like a, like a very subtle tutorial.、Mm, that, that's why that's, that's interesting there. Interesting point. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, no, I have always wondered whether it was to slow the action down. That's interesting. Now, Wesker's report from North America, he's、mm. asked a couple of questions,、mm. one with regard to Biohazard 3's development, and we've gone over that.、Uh, but his other question, he wants to ask the liquor in Biohazard 2, and、uh, you're very much part of the team that, that came up with that. Why was the liquor from Biohazard 2 not featured in Biohazard 3? There are a few reasons. First, のは2以降になるんで、うん、2の前だからリッカーはいないっていうことがまず一つの理由と、あと、リッカーは割と特殊な作りをしてたんですよ。あと、キャラクターとしても関節数とか結構多く、ちょうど3の背景に乗せるっていったことがちょっと難しい部分があったんで、基本的なところで。はい uh, well... There are a few reasons、uh, why the liquors were not included. From a story perspective, since three takes place before two, the liquors didn't exist. But if you're going to bring up the fact that part of it also takes place after, so that's where we come up with the excuse of technical related <laughs> stuff. We did reuse Resident Evil 2's engine, but there were actually certain limitations that made li implementing liquors in the game kind of difficult. You know, given the scale of the game, we didn't think it was worth it to go you know, back and rearrange just to include liquors. So that's pretty much why they're not in the game, unfortunately. It, it was something specifically related to system related. Were you instructed, or do you feel the need to pay particular attention to quite specific details from Resident Evil 2 so that you got that continuity between 2 and 3, with 3 being a prequel, so there weren't any errors in the timeline? てるっていうのは何を指してるのかなまあ、あの、1と2をそのまま、えー、まあ、設定とかは、えー、それを生かすような形で作っているんで、なぜと言われると答えにくいけど、どう、どう言ったらいいの<笑>うるさく言う、えー、やつが、えー、ちょうど入ってきたんで、うんうんうん、それのおかげかもしれないですね。そいつにありがとうかな。ああ、はいはいはい。<笑> All right, so yeah, I mean, you know, it's, it's a little bit of a difficult question to answer for various reasons.、Um, because 
I mean, the games are connected, yes, but I didn't make Resident Evil 3 expressly for the purpose of making sure it wrapped around Resident Evil 2. I think a lot of the stuff that did eventually connect between the two games was thanks to uh, Kawamura-san, Yasuhisa Kawamura, joining the development team. And I think he was the, the brainchild of a lot of the interactions that the two games okay. had. Now, Neptune from England, he asks, when planning the development of Biohazard 3, was there any joint collaboration with the team working on Biohazard 4D Executor? So yeah, um, Biohazard 4D Executioner was a CG movie that was made specifically for theme parks or some kind of entertainment venue. So in that sense, there was no direct collaboration between our team and their team. I do remember providing reference materials for the other team to use. I think that's the extent. There's debate in the fan community as to whether Biohazard 4D Executor can be considered a canon installment, an official installment, even debate as to whether it takes place in Raccoon City. So I'm not sure if you can cast any light on that, but even so, just knowing that there mm. were assets given over to that team, because I know there are, there are some people that, that will have it that it wasn't even based in Raccoon City. I, for one, believe that it was. So I'd be fascinated on your, your input on that. Okay, so yeah, this goes back to what I was saying earlier, but that's pretty much up to Capcom to decide. I certainly was not ever thinking about it when I was working on Resident Evil. Okay. Another question from Newspot, he asks, are you happy to talk about any experiences you had working with the late Noboru Sugimura? のせやすいし、え、やる方もえ、バイオ<笑> Actually, yeah, regarding working with Sugimura-san, Mr. Sugimura, I actually watched a lot of TV dramas and TV shows like Super Sentai that uh, he wrote the scenarios for when I was a kid. Oh. It was pretty remarkable that I began working with him. We, we began working uh, together. Actually, the, the one game that we worked together on directly was Dino Crisis mm. 3. Yeah, at, at, toward the very end, Sugimura-san was often late with deliveries regarding like scenario planning and whatnot. So it was a bit of an unfortunate uh, last few years. You know, I, I hope that, you know, he's, you know, at peace, you know, since he passed away uh, around just right after that. Sugimura-san, um, when he joined the Biohazard team, you know, he brought upon a lot of great ideas and he was really able to influence the story in a positive way. And not just the story, but even like from a gameplay perspective, he was able to offer up a lot of ideas that allowed us to improve the game, uh, particularly Resident Evil 2. Yeah. So, yeah. Resident Evil chick from North America. Now she asks, mm -hmm. um, what are your thoughts on the announced remaster of Biohazard 2? Would you like to see the same for Biohazard 3? And if so, what would you like to see for this remake? What's your opinion on the debate surrounding whether to include or omit the classic survival horror gameplay from the original games? <laughs> お客さん 
、バイオ2ラスターっていうのをちゃんと残した状態のものを作ったらいいんじゃないかなっていうふうに思うし、うんうんうんえっと、もう一つ考えとしては、例えば、えーっとまあ、タイプがどうこうっていうよりかは、また新しい素敵な形っていうことでリメイクしてくれたら、もっと面白いなと。まあ、えっと、個人的なところで言うと、あの、アナウンスしてから随分経ってんやから、早く出したらどうやっていうと<笑>まあ、いろいろ、いろいろ大変なんやろうなっていうふうに思うけどね。だから2に対して。2に対して。<笑> 3がリメイクされるとなると。3、うん、あの、それも、えー、今、2で言ったことと同じで、あ,あの、はいリメイクって言ってる部分はしっかりと押さえた方が、それはいいんじゃないかなと。もし、本当に、えー、作るやったら、例えば、うん、セブンで全然違う形になったような形っていうのを、えー、お客さんに見せた方が。Yes,、uh, regarding you know, remakes in general, but I guess with the Resident Evil 2 remake in particular,、um, I think there are merits to, to both approaches. You know, it, there is some merit in remaking a game that's faithful to the original game as much as possible. You know, so you can see it reborn kind of in a new fashion. But at the same time, you know, I do also believe that there is merit to remaking a game, but kind of envisioning it in a different way. So, you know, changing things up a bit, even something, you know, considerably different from the original. I think that's also quite,、uh, quite a cool thing. You know, even with regards to Resident Evil 2's remake, you know, I do, I do have to wonder on a personal level, you know, they announced the game a long time ago and we haven't seen anything yet. So, You know, I wonder if, how, how development is progressing, you know, if they're having any trouble or not. If we do end up remaking Resident Evil 3, I guess I would have the same kind of mentality. You know, I would kind of、um, skew toward maybe changing things up a bit to keep it fresh. And would you at all like to be involved in that? Because I noticed that when they remastered Biohazard Zero in HD for current consoles,、mm. There was an interview with the original developer, and I believe he had some input into the development of, the, of, of that remaster. So, would that be something that you'd be interested in working on? <laughs> yeah, I mean, if, if, if there's an opportunity, yeah, why not? <laughs> So, yeah, you know, thank you very much for the opportunity to have this interview today.、Uh, I think these last two hours doing the interview have been very valuable and are a very important part, or a very important thing for me. So, you know, I hope that the people listening to this interview were able to enjoy it very much. Well, can I just say it's a huge responsibility to talk on behalf of not just so many people, but people that have such a personalized passion for a video game that you've been so heavily involved with. Can I just, on behalf of all those fans, thank you so very, very much for this generous time and consideration that you've put into this interview, talking about something that you've been a part of, something that you've created that has resonated very, very deeply with, with many people and has brought enormous amounts of joy and interest to a whole global community. Thank you. <laughs> こちらこそありがとうございます。<笑>はい。本当に光栄な経験になりました。はい。内容でした。はい。Yeah, the, the, the pleasure was all mine. He wants nothing more than game fans to enjoy that as well. That comes across in the answers very much so. In our exchanges leading up to the interview, it really came across, and that was one of the things that brought my nerves down. During that interview, almost as it started, it was like talking to a, a fan who had a similar passion. So thank you. <laughs> I've been following this series since 1996, and it's got me through some personal challenges and, and losses.、Uh, and to be able to speak with you today has been the absolute highlight of that. I'll never forget it. Thank you so much. I guess that's good. That it was good we made Resident Evil then, you know. <laughs> So, yeah, I just, Aoyama san just wants to thank、uh, you guys for everything that you've done.、Uh, we hope you enjoyed the interview. 
I'm Joe White, the voice of Chris Redfield. When I'm not surviving the horror of the Spencer Mansion, I'm listening to the Crimson Head Elder podcast. This is Katie O'Hagan, the voice of Mia Winters, and when I'm not babysitting temperamental bioweapons, I'm listening to the Crimson Head Elder podcast. My name is Richard Wall. Just think of me as a ghost from the past. This is Paula Rhodes, Evelyn in Resident Evil 7 Biohazard. This is Michelle Ruff, the voice of Jill Valentine. I'm Reva DePala, the voice of Rebecca Chambers. Hi, my name is Allison Court. My name is Sarah Coates, the voice of Marguerite Baker, and you are listening to Crimson Head Elder Podcast. Want to come to dinner? <laughs> 